tell ChatGPT to train that model differently. Uh, up next, we, <laughs> we have a, a keynote from one of the keynote sponsors of the event and a friend of GSV's long time, uh, Amit Sevak, the president and CEO of ETS, edu Educational Testing Service. With the disruption of COVID, the move to online, and the advent of AI, we face a revolution in the educational assessment, a massive opportunity to deploy artificial intelligence responsibly, and an urgent need to reinvent measurements. I hope, in this talk, Amit will share insight from his first year as, as the new CEO of ETS and his vision for how ETS will expand its impact by harnessing insights to improve learning for individuals around the world. Amit, come on up. Hi there. Educational data. There's so much talk about what data matters in our sector. We're at a conference that's bringing together innovators, founders, disruptors, operators, marketing experts, investors. There's this realization that we're all kind of touching around, which is that data somehow is relevant. But if you look at the last couple of years of what's happened in education, and particularly in ed tech, we've tended to focus a lot on the commercial data points. We've tended to look at the number of leads, the CPC, the clicks, the CACs, the cost of acquiring a customer. And if we started to talk a little bit about the learning side, the outcome side, they tended to talk about number of programs completed going to the next course, the conversion rate from one to the next. But the question that comes to mind when we're thinking about learning outcomes, which was a theme of yesterday's discussion and earlier today, is actually what type of data is relevant? What should we as leaders, as entrepreneurs, be focused on when it comes to educational data? I'd like to postulate that in the world of generative AI, in the world of technology, as it's evolving, that it's actually the skill-based data that is the most critical. That is to say, in the learning outcomes that we're looking at, it's actually the data that's actually acquired by the learner that I'd like to propose is the most important focus as we go forward in any walk of education. So whether it's K-12, whether it's higher ed, whether it's workforce, or in any subsect, whether it's in India, for an India-focused organization, or looking globally, skill-based learning and the competencies and the data that we're demonstrating actual outcomes is really what will make the difference between the winners and the others as we move forward. The reason I'm bringing this up is because data is in some ways the new oil, isn't it, in our global economy? These incredible valuations of companies and the marketing technology and fintech and health tech these are organizations that are harnessing the power of data. The Googles of the world, the multi-trillion dollar organizations, they're really data companies. So what's our vision for ETS? Our vision is ETS becomes the leading education data organization for K-12, for higher ed, and for the workforce. We aspire to really, in an ethically and responsibly way, uh, responsible way, leverage the incredible power of tests that produce data. Because if you think about it, what's a test? But a moment to capture data of a particular individual's learning at that point in time. A test is a moment to capture data. But the thing we as the education sector have the opportunity to do is to figure out how to organize that data, how to harness that data, how to responsibly use that data to actually drive learning outcomes. So my challenge to education investors is to really ask are we doing enough to measure the learning outcomes at the skill level? Because just getting a program completed, or just even getting a high school degree or a college degree, doesn't mean there was actual skill acquisition, right? And so the opportunity for us to reimagine the acquisition of data in our sector in a way that drives learning outcomes is what we're aspiring to do. ETS just announced last week a important new initiative with the Ministry of Education. The division called NCERT is the National Center for Educational Research and Training. NCERT selected ETS to be their technical partner for the entire PARAC initiative, 
We're very proud of this. This was a competitive process, so we're doubly proud of what the team here at ETS India in collaboration with our ETS colleagues back in the United States and around the world did in that competitive bid. What does Parak mean? The Parak initiative that the Indian government has recently launched is this revolutionary initiative to provide a set of standards, set of guidelines or norms for the Indian government to align and organize assessments. Because as the famous venture capitalist John Doerr said, let's measure what matters. If we really care about education, we've got to measure it. And not just at the generic outcome level of did they complete the course or did they complete the program, but are individual students, are learners actually acquiring skills? Are we capturing skill level data? Competency-based assessments is part of the answer. So the Parak Initiative is a very exciting initiative that's going to start with addressing the 250 million students in the Indian K-12 system. The system currently is organized across the 36 states. We have 62 school boards in India, and each school board has their own set of standards of how they are assessing student outcomes. So the aspiration that NSERT has within the Ministry of Education is to find a really standardized way that we can measure and compare progress across the states, progress across school districts, and ultimately, perhaps even progress at the teacher level. Skill-based advancement in education. So there's a lot of work to do, but the Parak Initiative is just one example of what we aspire to do here in India at the K-12 level. We aspire to help the school boards, the districts, and ultimately the teachers have skill-based assessments that drive some of the learning outcomes that we're all aspiring. As the presentation just shared earlier, over two-thirds of individuals, of students, are not able to get to basic literacy and basic numeracy. There's a huge opportunity to reimagine assessments as a way to power the educational advancement. EdTech plays a role, individual teachers play a role, but ultimately, isn't it the data that we know, that we feel re is reasonably reliably pulled together that helps us measure that progress? And isn't it time that we coordinate that? So that's what we're trying to do with the Ministry of Education. In addition to K-12, we're really excited about opportunities to partner with universities. In fact, in the next hour, we're gonna be meeting with a group of vice chancellors throughout India as an opportunity to evaluate ways that we can serve. The same concept applies. If you think about a classic university, and there are about a thousand universities here in India, you've got a vice chancellor or the leader, you've got a leadership team, but what is the function that's actually measuring learning progress in the classroom? I used to teach at the higher ed level. I love international relations, so I used to teach my courses on international economics and politics and trade. I was never trained on how to administer a test. I just, you know, had my questions, I had my texts, I offered an exam, and I graded them on it. But I didn't have the pedagogical foundation to really measure, did someone learn something or not? How am I assessing them? And is it actually valid? Is it fair? Am I biased? How do I enable faculty members to be supported with assessments that are allowing them to provide scalable solutions to really assess the skills that are being acquired in the classroom? And how can I, as a vice chancellor, aggregate some of that classroom data in a way that allows me to see, am I just pushing students along in college, or am I actually helping them advance their learning at the classroom level? So the opportunity in higher ed is enormous to drive through assessments better skill-based learning that really drives completion rates, so they're career ready, so that they're graduating with skills, so that they're relevant for the work world. That's what we're aspiring to do for higher education here in India, to really enable this skill-based economy, a theme of this conference, inside of higher education. Which brings me to the work world. The workforce revolution in India is super exciting, but this is an incredible opportunity we can't waste. There are 600 million individuals below the age of 30 in this country. We have an obligation. It's more than an opportunity. It's an obligation to find ways to deliver assessments and education at the same time so people have the certificates, have the signals to really drive this economy forward. And we're really excited to have that opportunity uh, to serve this market in that way as well. So K-12, higher ed, workforce, transitioning to a data-centric educational 
ecosystem is really what we're all excited about. And I'll just end by sharing as someone of Indian background, uh, my parents are originally from Gujarat, it's just really extremely exciting. You know, when I first came to India when I was little, I always felt like I was kind of going back in time. Uh, when I go to our little hometown with the cows running around and just the rickshaws, I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I? But now I can't wait to get here because I really feel India is the future in every way possible in terms of the technology, the data, the way we're driving the economy, the way human capital is invested in. I'm really inspired by what I'm seeing here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit, and thank you again for your sponsorship of the event. This would not be possible without your support and with the support of ETS and all of our, our partners. So thank you.